Hi. Everyone ready? Hi. Welcome back. Um, and this is really exciting. I'm really excited about to introduce all these wonderful people that did an amazing job last August for the rescue of the minke whale that was right here in the harbor, right by the Coast Guard um, slips over by the Coast Guard Pier. And we have a great group of people with from different agencies that all came together to, in one mind, to help rescue this minke whale that was up in the slip and sort of caught in there by the rocks. So well, I'm, all I'm going to do is introduce this great group of people. Where I'm going to start down at the other end with the U.S. Coast Guard. Um, we have um, Robert Graziano. Raise your hand. He's down there. And then this wonderful young lady who um, is actually a sailor, so she was helpful in some of the part of the rescue, um, BM3 Sarah Scudder. Then we have the fire department. We have Lou Valdez right down there. And in between, next to him is um, Officer Kimberly Zook right there. And then on the other side of her is one of the other gentlemen from the fire department, who is Justin Cooper. And then your from the Monterey Bay Harbor Patrol. Alex. Alex, OK, yeah. I, you just came in, so I wasn't sure if you were Alex or the other gentleman, Jimmy. And then we have. From the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, we have two representatives that were essential in that rescue, is Scott Cathy, and then Karen Grimmer, and then part of our network with the whale entanglement team for rescuing whales in Monterey and other places around um, here is Kate Spencer, who is the owner of Fast Raft. She runs a whale watch and is very capable who was there that evening. And then the gentleman that was in charge who got authorization from Peter Falkins, who is our lead, or level four, is Bob Talbot. And he's going to lead the panel this evening. So it's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Peggy. Well, I'll try to be brief my little lead in here. Um, this situation was, was, a, was a bit surreal. And you'll, you'll see that when Karen shows some photographs here in a, mi a minute. Um, I was working on Big Blue Live, and we had just got back from another long day of shooting. Everybody was pretty much cooked. Um, we were derigging the boat. I'd taken off to get the trailer, come back, and I was just about a block away when I got a call from the producer who said, in, in typical UK and British uh, understatement, uh, Bob, we have a little bit of a situation here. <laughs> so <laughs> apparently, uh, uh, Tom Payne, the producer, and my crew were, were like front row center when this minky whale went under the docks, bumped up against a couple of sailboats, and then went completely under the dock and got stuck between the breakwater and the dock. Uh, my first call, of course, was to Peter Falkins, as, as Peggy pointed out. Peter is our lead on this. He called NOAA in uh, D.C. He gave me very explicit instructions not to touch the whale, and I understood that completely. But I said, that doesn't mean we can't make a plan. <laughs> so we got on the dock there. And you know, I, I do a lot of work in whale conservation and in marine conservation. And one of the things that's the most frustrating uh, part of all that is that there's always a reason not to do something. And I got to tell you, this was one of the most inspiring experiences of my life, because every one of the people you see up here, every one of them said yes to everything. I remember Officer Zook approached me when I was down there in the dock, and I thought, okay, this is the first time I'm going to get busted on this, on this evening. I know it's going to be multiple. But first thing she said was, what do you need? What can we do? Fire department, what can we do? Coast Guard, what can we do? And we came up, we all got together, we put our heads together and came up with a scheme to essentially lasso the whale's tail or sling the whale's tail on one side of the dock and pull it out backwards the other way. Um, it was a tall order, but if you were there, and when you see these pictures, and I think Kate and Karen will speak to this, there was simply no way to walk away from this situation. It was such a horrible scene, seeing this whale rolling around in the rocks, all bloodied. Um, but then we had to get past the, the, uh, the problem you know, of getting permission. And uh, so Peter called me back and said, well, I spoke to Noah, and they said, no, we, we need to just leave it the way it is. And that's when I had to walk down the dock because my 
language was deteriorating quickly. And so <laughs> I had this conversation with Peter. We'd, he'd sent pictures. We had everybody lined up. Everybody was on board. And I think that had a lot to do with Noah saying yes. We had every agency willing to do whatever it took to get this whale out of there. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Karen and uh, Karen Grimmer from Sanctuaries and, and uh, Kate Spencer from Fast Raft to talk a little bit about kind of what happened. Hi, everybody. So I'm Resource Protection Coordinator for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and I'm really proud to be up here today with this group of people. Um, it was an amazing experience to work with community members that just wanted to take care of that whale and make sure that it was uh, rescued, and um, it was a very inspiring experience. And luckily, we had an amazing photographer there, so we have a few great pictures, and I just want to run through a few of them to set the scene. So this is a black and white, you'll notice, um, and we did a black and white because if it was colored, you'd see red, completely the whole, all of the water. Um, so we wanted to tone it down a little bit for kids that might be in here. Oh, actually I want this one. And um, this is the shot that Bob sent to Peter Falkins, uh, our lead, and, um, and then Peter sent that to me. And I was at home, and I just remember getting this picture with no text, nothing else, just the picture, and my response was, what? So um, I found out what was going on and headed down there. Kate was already um, there with Bob and others, too, and we just saw this dramatic scene of the whale stuck essentially up on the rocks. You can see the rocks here. It had swam right under a um, part of the pier that was open and could not get out. So here's another shot with a very labored breath and that was part of being in, in this place right next to a whale where it's trapped and it's, it's breathing very, very hard. Uh, it's moving back and forth um, and it's very stressed out. That affected all of us. So we were kind of um, feeling its pain, so to speak, and in this very urgent um, mode, but somehow figured out through all of that chaos what to do. And um, there were a lot of level heads there that have been in emergencies many, many times, not one like this, but it, it really helped to have fire, police, Coast Guard, sanctuary, um, you know, all of our wet volunteers there together. Here we are, another shot. It just gives you an idea of the small space that the, we had to work in. Um, and as light goes down, um, this was about, I guess it was about five o'clock, starts to get darker, six or so. Um, and this is a shot of basically fire. We decided a fire hose would be less abrasive on the whale. Um, and after numerous tries to try to get it around the tail, the fluke of the whale, and pull the whale out under the pier, it just didn't work. Um, and one of the reasons it didn't work is I think we were using a smaller vessel, um, and we realized we needed a bigger boat. <laughs> um, and a minke whale this size, even though it doesn't look that large, is about 18 to 20 tons. So it's, it's a large animal. Here we are, another shot, trying to get the, the line around the, the body of the whale this time, so there was a bit more leverage. And it was hooked onto the Coast Guard gutter, cutter um, on the other side of the berth. And we'll get to that shot. The whale by this time, this is maybe three hours into it, um, was getting more and more abraded on the rocks. Um, you can see a metal cable there, which was uh, chafing its eye. Um, and it was getting more and more stressed out. So we knew we had to act. So in the upper part here, you can see the cutter um, right in the berth behind the pier. And we had inserted the, f the fire hose under the, the floating dock 
around the body of the whale, which was, I would say, um, fire and your rigor. Was, who's Matt. not here today? Is he? Matt O'Connor. Matt O'Connor. Um, we're definitely kind of the architects of that approach, that technique, and um, very carefully we're able to get the, the line around the whale. And here we are pulling, the whale's being pulled out, and now it's under the, it's, it's free. Um, it's still attached to the Coast Guard cutter. Um, and here I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna give it to Kate because you are part of this part. More involved. Okay. I'll stand over here. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. Um, this, yes, this was all very exciting. I'm actually up on the bow of the boat there, and what you have to understand is that whales don't swim backwards, they swim forwards, and goldfish go backwards, and some kinds of fish go backwards, but whales and dolphins swim forward, and they don't back. Um, humpbacks are very maneuverable, they can turn in very tight quarters, and minke whales are fairly small, but this whale had swum forward from basically where you see the boat there, under the dock that these people are standing on, and then had gotten up onto the rocks. And on the left side was a cable, and on the right side were some bigger rocks. And it had no room to turn around, and it couldn't swim backwards because they're not built for that. Their flippers are only for basically steering, like wings, basically. So the whale was trying to go forward, and it just kept trying to go forward into the rocks. And there was no way it was getting anywhere. So when, when Bob says, you know, none of us who were there could stomach the idea of leaving it there, it's because it just kept trying to get out. So we had to help it. So we did pull it backwards, and uh, we had a couple of attempts to, to loop the line under the tail, um, but ultimately what was successful was slipping it over the body and working it all the way back to the tail to make sure that it was actually close enough and tight enough to, to pull on the whale without just falling off to the side. And this was not a knot. We don't do knots around whale's tails. We spend way too much time cutting knots off of whale's tails that inadvertently get on there. So we knew better than to do, th to do that. It was just a, um, if, if this is the whale's tail, the head is my elbow. We just had the loop going under one side and out the other so that it was just, you know, pulling like this. And once we pulled it out, the idea was to t make a turn. If the boat turns towards the left of the picture there, that's the exit of the harbor. To the left is land, and we're out on the Coast Guard Pier, which is the very long stone pier on the uh, west side of the Monterey Harbor. The idea was to pull it out and make the turn and pull it all the way out to the mouth of the harbor and then let it go and hopefully it'll swim off into the ocean. Unfortunately, the whale had other ideas. It was very cooperative at this point. It was exhausted. It probably didn't quite realize it was moving backwards and it just kind of was going, oh my gosh, I'm not stuck, I'm not stuck, I'm not stuck. Oh, something's pulling on me. And then it started to pull forward. And so I'm on the bow of this boat. We'd made the 90 degree turn and um, two very alert guys were on the front, you know, with the ends of the line around a couple of bits on the bow of the Coast Guard boat and um, the the skipper's up on the top so that there's a lot of communication going on there. And I was on the bow watching the whale really closely. And as soon as we had made that turn and it was pointed toward the boat ramp, which is land, unfortunately, and we were backing out towards the mouth of the harbor, the whale started to pull. And it pulled with all its might and it was phenomenal. I had no idea a whale could pull a Coast Guard 47 foot life bart, lifeboat in full reverse forward. Granted, it only had one engine in reverse because of the tight maneuvering quarters. It couldn't throw full reverse on both, but this whale was pulling really hard, and there was all this thrashing water, and I'm watching this going, don't break your tail, whale. And so I watched for a few moments. I'm like, are we going to even out, or is it going to stop? Are we going to be able to pull it back? Can we get it out of the harbor? And I just realized, no, we're going to do way too much damage with this, and I just said, cut the lines. And so they cut the lines. The lines sank off because it wasn't a knot. It was just a loop. And the whale then relaxed and swam up to another floating dock, and we're all going, no, <laughs> don't do that. And at that point, we commenced uh, phase two, which was banging on things to try to chase the whale away. And there was a lot of wonderful coordination with fire, relaying information by radio to, okay, guys, go down this dock. Okay, people bang on things. Okay, what can we find to bang with? And okay, people over there bang on this dock. And then the whale swam over there. And it swam between this huge yacht and another dock. And we're like, whale, <laughs> don't yeah. do that. And you can actually see the yacht. It, so it basically got past this dock, went over into the next huge area. That's the fuel dock. And um, eventually came out from between the yacht and the dog and we got into the where'd he go Alex 
we got into the harbor patrol boat. So uh, Justin and I got in the harbor patrol boat to continue to try to chase this whale out of the harbor. And it took a really long time. It was not in good shape. It was disoriented. It was only turning right. And we had, you know, pipes and things were banging on the boat and trying to get the whale to turn left. And we finally gave up on that and chased it in a couple of really large circles out of the harbor and eventually at about 10 o'clock at night after hours of this whole process we saw the whale breathing out at the mouth of the harbor past all of the moored boats past all of the floating docks and everything and hopefully off into freedom and we aren't terribly hopeful for its long-term prognosis but at least it's not in there we got it out and again it was just an incredible thing to keep hearing people from all these different agencies and all these different directions saying what is it going to take? What do we need? The fire department sacrificed a hose that we could use as, um, as sort of the softening, um, threaded a line through that, and that's what was on the whale's tail so that a, a rope wouldn't cut into it. So that helped. Um, there are just so many different examples of, of ways that people were helping. So how's that? And just before we pass it off to everybody else here on the panel, um, we wanted to write, I wanted to uh, let the community know what an amazing event it was. So we wrote up a quick little um, op-ed and shared that in the Monterey Herald. I think it came out like three weeks later. But um, again, just highlighting how everybody worked so amazingly well together. And um, I think, you know, we it was such a satisfying moment to around 1030 or 11 at night, whenever it was, to have that well going back out. So with that, maybe we can pass it along to others that were on scene. I'll uh, put on my moder moderator hat here. How, what do I do here to t get this down? Go, oh, how about that? No? No? Yeah. Okay. Or, I think Bill will cut it down. Yeah. Yeah, you can just close it off. There we go. Cool. So, I, you know, I haven't seen a lot of these folks since that night, and I, I've been really wondering what everybody's concerns were because you know like I said to me the most amazing thing is that everybody said yes and everybody said what can we do and everybody kind of put themselves on the line for that you know whether it from a bureaucratic standpoint or a safety standpoint or whatever equipment standpoint um, so I just like to go down the line and just kind of ask you guys what was going through your head when we were saying hey we want to get this whale out of here and and you were all so eager to, to, to jump in. Rob, from the Coast Guard standpoint. I think just getting the whale out of the harbor, you know, with it being safe, that was pretty much our, our main concern, not doing any more damage to itself. So we, we had watched it. I had arrived on scene right at sunset. We were uh, going to secure the pier for the night, and we saw it there. And as that happened, we watched it knock one of the pilings loose on that building that it was oh, under. Wow. So after seeing the power that it had getting tangled up in those wires or that building building falling down on it, we didn't want to want it to get out of there as soon as possible. So so from a command standpoint, how how many steps did you have to go through to get the okay for your agency? I contacted my executive officer um, right away and he basically passed it on to the commanding officer I believe and it was do what we can to help right Great. off the bat. That's awesome. Sarah did you have anything to add to that? You summed it up perfectly. <laughs> Lou with the fire department I, y you guys are all over this as well it was Jim Courtney was coming up to me saying whatever you need which again I just I can't stress this enough that everybody was throwing down so from your perspective what, what were you guys thinking yeah from our perspective I, I was the acting division chief that day so we first got the call of a whale being stuck in one of the slips at, near the Coast Guard Pier so we didn't realize the seriousness of the situation until we got down there and then at that point Captain Cooper was actually the first in captain on that call and I go in and as a acting division chief I support his operation so really it was feeding him resources that he needed based upon the reports I was getting from him. And he was actually working with the sanctuary crew and the Coast Guard crew and the Harbor Master's Office, Public Works, Monterey Police Department. They were all down there working already. So one of my big things is to set up a command structure and then feed him resources and ensure the safety of the crews as they work. Still, well, that's a good point because yeah. at one point to get that line around the whale, we had 
fire department personnel climbing under that building over the rocks at night within feet of this thrashing whale. And I know my guy, Matt O'Connor, was up on a rock, on the rocks at the other end of that line trying to get it around the whale. And I had all the faith in the world that you had the safety under control, but I got to say there's a couple moments there I was like, yikes. No, safety is number one. But again, we, there's always a little bit of risk in the type of work that we do, so we, we temper it. Um, another thing, too, we notified the city manager's office, and our assistant fire chief came down, Jim Courtney. He was there offering his support to me and to the entire operation. So Great. it was uh, get the whale out of the slip <laughs> as Super. safely as possible. Super. Officer Zick from Monterey PD, what, what, were, your, what were your guys' take on it? Uh, well, initially I got the call, and it's already been a, a 10 or 12-hour day for me, and I dispatch sends me to uh, the Coast Guard pier, pier with a, a whale stuck in the harbor. And of course, I'm thinking, okay, where's the camera? <laughs> okay, gigs up, let's go. It's, um, and so, of course, we get some variety of calls all the time and some being very strange. And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do with this? So we get out there, and of course, my initial concern once we see exactly the condition of the whale in, and clearly this whale was stuck and very distressed, and it was more than just, okay, a whale had wandered into the harbor. It was it was a, a serious situation as you saw with the photos and the, the tight quarters that everybody was working in. Um, initially my idea is, is who do we need here and let's get them here and that was a, that was really happening. I have to say I was very relieved when I saw, is it Kate, right? Kate showed up. Kate was on it. She she had made all the calls. People knew what to do and it was uh, uh, a relief to see that. Um, from my standpoint, my biggest concern when I got there was, okay, it's after 5 o'clock, it's going to start getting dark here soon. Clearly, this is not going to be a quick scenario. Let's think about what our lighting options are going to be. Um, secondly, as someone had mentioned, there was the, the little housing unit um, that the pylon had already been knocked down on. thought is, okay, if the whale knocks that down, that's an electrical, that, that building has power to it. Is that going to create an electrical issue with the water? Um, and then we have all our personnel out there that's working. Um, and I don't know where they came from, but life jackets were being tossed around and floated around. That was a great thing. So, you know, it was in a terrible situation. It was the perfect storm of resources and a response to really uh, have a happy ending for that whale. So, yeah. You know, what, what strikes me is all these things that are going on with all these different folks that no one of us were really aware of. And, and no one of us could possibly coordinate in the small stretch of time we had to do this. And I, it was it was kind of this beautiful dance that happened without anybody really knowing what exactly was going on in other areas, which was which was pretty cool. I mean, like like I said, life jackets are appearing out of nowhere. Fire department's thinking about safety on one hand. You're thinking about the electrical. I didn't even think about that when we were there. It's, it's a great flash. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Justin, I'm sorry. Floodlights too. Yeah. 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 We were, we had requested yeah. lights, and the fire department I think provided those. Justin, what was your take on it? No, I agree. Overall, the incident went very well on my part and the part of everyone up here. It was a full team effort. Uh, you know, Not one agency could have done what was done to get that well out. And it, it kind of goes to show, too, that um, we typically don't work together on a lot of incidents up, you know, that happen. This, this is the first incident of this nature that I've ever been on. It might even be the last incident that I'll go on with the whale tangled in the harbor the way it was in there. And it just goes to show of how many different organizations came together for a common purpose and a common goal to get the well out. Um, and, it, and I thought it went very smooth for agencies not working together across uh, uh, you know, everyday scenarios. It went very smooth on that part of things, which uh, I was fortunate for. You know, as a first end engine company responding into the incident, we also have our fireboat parked there. So we had to get our fireboat out of the way. We knew there was damage to the piling. That actually, the structure that was damaged is actually our boathouse structure uh, with the Coast Guard. It's a shared structure, and we have a whole bunch of equipment in there, and there is live electrical um, in there uh, so that poses a hazard. And at one point during the, the, the rescue operation, we actually did have personnel underneath that structure trying to help shuttle this hose strap to get around the whale to pull the whale out. 
and we actually did lose a full structural support of that structure. So, you know, we are weighing into those uh, risk versus re reward benefits of, of are we doing the right thing, what are we doing, safety is a concern. Some of the things we talked about too was actually cutting up the dock and removing the dock out of the way to see if that would help. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about expensive inf 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 infrastructure of the city and of the Coast Guard. If we had to cut it and remove it out of the way to save a, save, save a whale, uh, that is uh, something that was considered. So we looked at all those different options and came with, came with a good plan and uh, I thought it worked uh, very well on that part of things. And uh, Lou was right on to resources we requested. I had a truck company down there, had another engine company down there uh, on top of our engine company. Our engine company is just a three-person company. Uh, so just in fire resources, uh, I know we had two engine companies, a truck company. You set up command um, on that side of things to cover accountability. And then all the other resources that came in, public works, uh, marine mammal media you, you, it just starts to, and you saw how packed it was in some of the pictures of some of the restaurants that were eating dinner um, so they're watching all this unfold um, so it was a big effort by everyone and uh, I you know I was happy with the at least the successful outcome of getting the whale out uh, back out to open ocean great thank you Alex you want to come on up because we're going to have some questions too Alex was the first person to chase me off the dock when I got there keeping the dock clear <laughs> But no, Alex. Anyway, why don't you come on over and give us your two cents for it, Paul? Thought it was a really good effort on everybody's part. Everybody's got a strengths, and uh, you know the fire department's always there, and they're always great to to help everybody out with the Coast Guard too. And it was great having you on the boat, and uh, we're just a really great team. Everybody works hard, and uh, we do a lot of training. Uh, but it's always nice to see the fire department guys there and the PD helping. In all our, all of our little incidences that always happen, we always seem to need each other very much. So, I appreciate all your guys' help and yours too. Thanks. Put you on the spot. So, Scott, it, Scott and Karen, as you know, they're, they're with National Marine Sanctuaries, and again, you're dealing with a lot of policy and bureaucracy and all the stuff that goes along with that. How was that with you guys? I mean. What was your take on that when you first heard what was going on and what we ought to do? Well, uh, marine mammals are uh, protected under the Federal Marine Mammal Protection Act. And uh, the part of NOAA that manages those animals and has to give approval to handle them is NOAA Fisheries. Now, we're, we're, the National Marine Sanctuary Program is in another part of NOAA, the National Ocean Service. So we're in a good position. You know, NOAA Fisheries was initially reluctant you know, they're saying, hey, nature's taking its course. You just allow this to play out, this scenario to play out. But, uh, you know, once we had eyes on scene, we're telling them, no, that's not really a good idea in this, in this circumstance. So that was one role that we played was to work within our own agency to talk to the Marine Mammal Stranding Coordinator with NOAA Fisheries to try to really give them an appreciation for what the situation was and, and the need to really go to some extraordinary efforts to try to pull this whale out. So when I got on scene, I mean, one of the things that was in the forefront of my mind, which I know it was with the other uh, response services, is human safety are in a whale that is trapped in a very tight space, and people are on the docks, which are directly over the top of this whale. And, uh, you know, as you're pulling on this, lines can snap. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, it can be a precarious situation. So. Uh, one of the things that several of us noted, though, was the boat that we had lined up to pull that whale. We started looking at that boat going, hmm, I'm not <laughs> sure that's a big enough boat. <laughs> so that's when we turned to the Coast Guard, and uh, the, the 47 has very powerful twin diesels. And I, I just want to echo what Kate was saying earlier. It was amazing to watch that whale pull that boat in full reverse and just start pulling pulling it forward. Um, so that's a testimony to, I mean, this is not a huge whale. I mean, this is a, what, maybe a moderate size minky, not full-grown minky. Uh, you think it's full-grown? Probably around 25 feet. Yeah, yeah. But um, nothing the size of a blue or a humpback. And um, the amount of power that this whale had after all of that fatigue mm -hmm. yeah. to be able to, to check the, the reverse motion of that boat and then actually start pulling it forward with it still in full reverse is pretty amazing. 
you know, those of us on the docks were saying, well, wh why are you going forward? Go backwards. Go backwards. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> right. Still remember it kind of jumped, did this little buckling motion, crazy. Um, one person I want to mention who wasn't at the scene, but he was really key, is Peter Falkins. He, uh, um, Peggy Staff with Marine Life Studies mentioned him on the last uh, presentation. He's um, the whale entanglement team lead, so to speak, with the the permit. And he was in San Francisco, but he was the person that we had to coordinate through as well. And so um, Bob and I had him on speed dial <laughs> in our, on our phones and checked in and kind of got some advice as we were going through this, which was really helpful. So another kudos to Peter on that. Um, and I want to mention Scott was able to handle uh, talking to the media, which was really helpful. And because um, we were keeping public folks back up on um, out of the actual area where the whale was. And um, except for BBC, who has got special permission to come down, and they were filming for Big Blue Live at that time. So they got some footage, and I think that was inc included in one of their programs. Um, and yeah, I guess lastly, just, um, well, I'll save my last thoughts till the end. <laughs> if I, let me just interject one thing about Peter Falkins. He, he was obviously not there. and literally had to put his his neck on the line for us by saying he would take responsibility for our actions which I remember thinking about the safety of everybody I was also thinking about the future of the whale entanglement program because you, you only get to mess up on one of these things once if somebody got hurt or something got seriously damaged it is it's really going to cost the whales in the long run so we all had to be very cognizant of that and we also had to be very cognizant of all the folks who are putting their, their necks on the line for this to go well because any one of these agencies could have had a problem and then the next time around they're like oh wait a minute last time this happened or that happened so it added another layer of concern I think for all of us to make sure we got it right Kate I guess I'm thinking about how whale rescues usually happen out at sea and the only people who actually see it are the ones who are on the boats and I run a whale watch I'm out there most days I've had a whale that I didn't even know was in the area surface next to me and realize that it has a float hanging off the back end of it and so I call it in and then we start the whole process of, of getting the disentanglement team out there and this happened right in the public view and uh, that was a very different scenario I mean we were being watched and they're figuring out what we're doing on the fly doing this incredible coordination of all these agencies and and private individuals who have never worked before together before basically on camera with the BBC right there. They were being very good, you know, staying out of the way, but everybody's watching to see how this goes. And it was really incredible to see how well it, it actually went and to realize that, you know, the public now knows that we did succeed in getting this whale out of there. And um, just in general, you should know that uh, lots of whales get entangled out there, but very few swim under docks. And it, some of you might already be wondering, why did this whale do this? And we don't know for sure. Several other humpback whales, usually small ones, had, had been swimming into the harbor following schools of anchovies that had been coming into Monterey Harbor and also in Moss Landing Harbor and many other nearshore places. So we'd been seeing this a lot. And at first we we're like, oh, yeah, sure, it's just another, you know, it's probably a humpback, you know, feeding on anchovies. This one may have been chasing anchovies over under the dock or it may have had demoic acid poisoning that got it confused and we don't really know exactly why it did it and we pro probably will never know but um, it's definitely not something that you see every day even no. if you're whale watching all the time. This was very exceptional. This, this is a side note on, on the humpbacks being in the in the harbor we were there with BBC and filming some of that and heard some folks behind us obviously from out of town saying I don't know why anybody would pay 60 bucks to go out well watching. All you got to do is come down here and right in the harbor, you know. Only in That was pretty good. So why don't we open this up to questions, guys. And um, anyone have questions, we'll pass the mic around. And let's start with this lady over here. In the Did the tide affect the recovery? It might have. We were watching that. And um, I think, was it? I think the tide was going out, yeah. which was quite a concern because that meant that the floating dock was going to be lower in relation to where the whale was in the rocks, and it would have been there would have been less uh, space for it under the under the dock for us to pull it out from under. Okay, that was a concern. Last. 
My question, well, I know that <laughs> Will didn't say thank you, but, but I'm sure he was very appreciative. But I was wondering, was there any uh, tracking system that was placed on the whale to find out what happened to the whale? Because I know that they do these things, but maybe in the quickness of the emergency, that couldn't happen. But well, I'm just curious if you know the next. Karen, did you want to? Yeah. Unfortunately not. We did not have a tracking system and that's something I think after the fact we thought about, you know, if this were to ever happen again, how could we improve it? It would be having some kind of um, archival tag that could be deployed on the whale um, so that we knew its survivorship. So we would know if it survived or not, where it went, if it did, and, um, you know, really understand what the outcome would be. And then secondly, I, I think we also thought about taking DNA samples, so samples of tissue, because um, that could have traced whether or not it was demoic acid poisoning um, and told us a little bit more about the situation. So in the moment, I think we were just all focused on <laughs> let's help this whale. And um, really, in hindsight, it would have been great to have both of those things. Well, there was there was plenty of tissue just on the rocks, oh. to be honest. Yes, uh, um, sure. there would have been an easy way to collect DNA from just the skin tissue. Yeah. Let me add something about the tagging. That's just another level of or another um, step in getting lots of coordination. We had amazing coordination here, but what we didn't have was scientists who had a suction cup tag that we could have used. They're probably nearby. There might have been something in the area that we could have used, but the right people didn't know about it and weren't there, and we were focused on getting it out. We do have a um, satellite tracking device that's used for whales that are entangled out in the open, but those that is a large, heavy buoy that we would never have attached to this whale that was already in bad shape. Sorry, oh, you have one more question there. You want to just. Yeah. So, regarding the whale, what is the pro was the prognosis for the whale to regenerate its skin that had been abraded? You want me to take that one? Of course. Um, <laughs> the abrasions may or may not have been that serious, but it seems like there was probably something serious underlying it. And um, I don't think it was in very good shape, and I don't think it probably survived very long. Um, we haven't seen it. We've definitely kept an eye out for it. If this whale surfaced, even being a minky, we call them slinky minkies. They're smaller than humpbacks. They're thin. They're very streamlined. They barely break the surface when they come up. They're hard to spot, but every time we have spotted one out there, we've looked really carefully to see if it had the abrasions, which were very obvious. So if this whale had been spotted, we would have, we would have known it, and we haven't seen it again. So it may not have lived long, um, but lots of other whales that have been entangled have survived, and there are lots of humpbacks out there with entanglement scars that have, and other kinds of wounds that have regenerated from pretty pretty serious injuries. So they do have a pretty fabulous immune system, um, but they're not immune to everything. So, some years back, we actually had a gray whale that had lost its tail that was sighted over a number of years, yep. swimming with it, it learned to wag its peduncle side to side rather than up and down to, to, to swim and I actually the migration I mean it's pretty amazing they're pretty pretty adaptable animals there's also scarback which is a gray whale who has what might be a, an old uh, harpoon wound wow. that's still open um, like it's at almost 20 years later and she's had a number of calves so it's incredible I think there's a question here So in the uh, whale entanglement team, we try to follow the incident command system. And I'm just wondering if uh, you all follow that and if that may have been sort of that unspoken um, language that you were all speaking that helped you work together so easily? I, you know, it, there wasn't that sense that this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. It was pretty much free form. <laughs> and um, 
I, and it, you know, the, I think what it came down to, from my perspective, what, what made it work the most was that, again, everybody wanted it to happen and nobody was invested in a position. So there was no egos going on. There was nobody, I know the right way and that's the only way. And I think that's what made it work because it was so free form in the moment. No, that isn't going to work. Let's try this. All right, let's try that. Let's try this. And you guys could probably speak better to that. From my perspective, we do follow the instant command system, and we apply that to every incident that we run, whether it's a simple medical emergency to a whale call or a fire in a large building. So from the command post, I was getting information from Captain Cooper, and then he's taking information in from the technical specialists. That information goes to me, then goes to my chief, and then I make special requests, make phone calls, and then that information goes back down to the resources on the scene. So we do follow it. Great. So, so I, I guess what I was speaking to is the overall, yes. like what Peter would be normally doing with the AJ squared away kind of protocol we would normally have wasn't going on, but clearly the other agencies had their protocol going on. Yeah. So there, I don't think there was like an overall, you know, well, there wasn't an overall incident command. Yeah. Let me add something on Yeah. That. Yeah. On, on our side at one point, our assistant fire chief, Jim Courtney, showed up on scene. And I punted a lot of the safety operations to him, so he was actually clearing at one point people from the front end of the dock as we were pulling the well, as the Coast Guard was pulling the well out from under the dock. And part of that was is, is um, you know, Lou made all the notifications since he was the div division chief that was on duty for the day. He made all those notifications. At one point, even the city manager showed up, or the assistant city man manager showed up because the city manager was actually out of town. Um, but we were able to get those resources and whatever work we were doing as far as the tactical and task level, which is the saturated level where it's the hands-on level where we got guys underneath hazards and, and, and banging on pipes or whatever needs to be done, I'm relaying all that information back to my incident commander who's basically accounting for the whole overall incident on our side of things. So um, we use that heavily with whatever position we're in. Even, uh, even if it's a 4th of July event, we will structure it based around an incident command system. and. Uh, just about every agency up here has had some level of training in that system. So. Karen, did you have something to add to that? Yeah. So um, just right at the scene of the, the whale rescue, I would say um, Coast Guard XO, who's not here today, um, and myself, so NOAA, Coast Guard, um, working with fire really closely, we're kind of the core what do we do now? <laughs> what do we do next? And then input from Kate, really important input from Kate and Bob. Um, and we would just make decisions as we went. We would see something that wouldn't work and then we'd say, okay, that's enough. Let's try, try another way. And it just, it was very um, fluid and, and we communicated a lot. I mean, we were just talking constantly and it, it worked. Yeah, I think, you know, there was not a formal incident command structure that was set up, but everybody involved is familiar with that system of dealing with an emergency. And so inside incident command, people have roles, and everybody slid right into where they knew their role fit. And so PD's taking care of, of issues that they know need to be handled, and they're the best suited to do that. Fire's doing the same. Coast Guard's doing the same. So it was there. It, it wasn't very obvious in a very f structured way. But I agree with you. As you, you know, when you said that, it made me think. Yes, I think it did come into play, because we accept, and everyone's looking. Okay, somebody's got to be in charge. This can't be 20 chiefs here. And the wet team was calling the shots as far as how we're going to kind of drive getting this whale out. But when it came to the logistics of, well, okay, wh where are we going to get the hose? Well, then fire steps up and goes, we can take care of that. And so everybody kind of pitched in where they saw the need. And we're and instant command is all about working together with people you've never worked with before, but kind of toward a common goal and having a sense of organization about it. And I, I, I would say it was very present, but as everyone has said, it was very fluid and it was, it was all, it just felt natural because everyone's worked inside that system before. Peggy, you have? I just have one more question. I want to ask Rob, because he's been on a few disentanglements with us this summer. He's been great. What did it feel like when that whale started pulling you? Uh, I got really nervous. That the boat we were using.
using is capable of towing 200 ton at the max, and we were almost full of stern on both engines when it started pulling us forward. So the uh, when when we said snap the line or cut the line, and they cut it, it was a big relief. <laughs> yeah, I bet he's been great. The Coast Guard has been wonderful this year. The sanctuary, everyone. I can't thank you all enough. And Mary Alice wants to say something, but thank you. I'd like to thank everyone here. Um, I'd like to ask if uh, anyone has seen Lord of the Rings or read the book. So you know that what it took in order to accomplish a goal was that everyone needed to uh, pull forth. And if they didn't, if there was one cog in the wheel that missed out, then it did not. Uh, it wouldn't have accomplished the goal. And so this is, um, you're looking at all the cogs in the wheel that m made it happen. And the reason why, I, I'm chair of the Whale Fest, Whale Fest Monterey, thank you for coming. Uh, the reason why I elected to have this panel come forth, and thanks to Peggy and everyone else who brought all of you here tonight, thank you so much, was to emphasize the incredible cooperation that exists within the agencies of the city of Monterey. What we have here is something very special to me. I was thoroughly impressed when I read uh, Karen Grimmer's article in the Herald. I knew about it, but to see the um, to see it actually written out and to count all the different agencies that were involved. Um, I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, yeah, I find it an over the top impressive that we have a federal agency, we have a, the National Marine Sanctuary, two federal agencies, we have the Coast Guard, and then and then the PD, the Monitor, and uh, and the uh, Fire Department, and the Harbor Master, and the. Uh, and uh, oh, and Mayos was there too, and uh, so and and a whole lot of other volunteers plus the public was all helping with this event. So it was to emphasize not about the whale, but what we have here in our human cooperation level. And there were no egos involved. This is, was a truly exciting evening. So thank you so much for coming today and for your night. Thank you.